All right. So again, just welcome to the May digital South Sound Surfrider meeting here. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to have Lisa joining us this evening. She is the assistant director of the Washington Stormwater Center, and her career has included not only her current position in stormwater management and research, but also environmental compliance, water quality, watershed management, and environmental awareness. So with 30 years of experience, Lisa is a wealth of knowledge and will speak to us about the Washington Stormwater, about what the Washington Stormwater Center does, um, as well as some other juicy tidbits here. So you're in for a treat. Um, and we are so thankful to have you uh, again on this beautiful sunny May day. Uh, and I'm just gonna turn it over you, to you, Lisa, to take it away. All right, thank you so much for having me. And I think, Liz, you were at the other presentation, correct? So this is a different presentation. Um, this one is more geared toward um, the Stormwater Center itself and kind of what we do and how we were created. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about our most recent uh, tire dust uh, research. So I will share my screen, I think I can do that. Um, and it looks like, is there someone waiting in the, oh no, I think, okay, sorry. I, yeah, I, thanks for catching that. I, I just let Joe back in. <clears throat> okay, uh, again, I'm electronically challenged. And so if something goes wrong, uh, I'll try to fix it. Uh, and then if you have any questions, I think, you know, either put them in the chat or interrupt me, however you wanna do it. And then there'll be time for questions at the end as well. All right, so uh, I am the Assistant Director of the Washington Stormwater Center. I've been in this position for just a few years, uh, but I've been with WSU for about 10 years now. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Stormwater Center and I am already off to a bad start of like not, I don't have my, um, I apologize. I don't have the, there they are. Okay, sorry. I couldn't see the, uh, the controls. <laughs> this is a terrible recording. I'm so sorry. All right. So no, today I'm talking about what the Stormwater Center does, um, what stormwater is and how it becomes a problem, uh, where does stormwater go and uh, what is in it. We're also going to talk about the impacts of stormwater and aquatic life. And then we're going to talk about, again, that, um, that most recent research that we've done, both in um, pre-spawn mortality in coho salmon and the cause of that that was just recently discovered. Um, and then we'll talk about some next steps and solutions as well. All right, let's see if I can do this. All right, so um, the Washington Stormwater Center was, um, what, sorry, was uh, created um, through a legislative mandate in 2009. Um, and they, the reason it was created is because businesses in particular wanted um, a neutral third party, an objective third party that wasn't a regulator that they could go to, to help them comply with their Clean Water Act permits. And in this state, it's the, um, the Industrial Stormwater General Permit. Um, there's also a permit for municipalities as well. And again, they, you know, they wanted to comply, but you know, they didn't want to go to the regula regulators and say, hey, I'm out of compliance, can you help me? So that's how we were created. It is a joint center between University of Washington Tacoma and WSU Puyallup. Um, and as you can see, we are in Puyallup and that is the, um, the research and extension center in Puyallup was actually uh, created in 1894. So we've been around a, quite a while. All right, excuse me. I'm sorry, I thought someone had a question. No, okay. All right, so this is what we do. We, we do research on polluted runoff and the effects on aquatic life. We do those stormwater permit assistance activities for industrial, municipal, and construction projects as well. And we do a lot of education and outreach on stormwater and its impacts. We also evaluate green stormwater infrastructure. Um, and that is gonna be a key part of the, uh, the presentation today. Um, we also have a program that is run by the University of Washington Tacoma. It's called the TAPE program, it's an acronym, but it's really, it's an evaluation of, uh, of stormwater treatment devices. So you can't just say, hey, I've got this widget and it's going to take all of your metals out of stormwater. You actually have to prove that it's gonna do that. So we evaluate that, we go through a protocol or the, the, we have the businesses go through a protocol and that 
sort of proves that they can then sell those those widgets to municipalities and, and businesses. All right, so we do have a lot of partners and funders that we um, that we work with. This is just a few of them. Um, Boeing is an enormous, huge supporter of ours. I'm really thankful for them. They have given us millions of dollars over the years, and I, I can't say enough great things about the work that they're doing. Um, but also, you know, Sea Grant and Urban Waters, and um, we work with some tribes um, as well as the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Um, and, and some other folks as well. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the problem of stormwater toxicity today. So what is stormwater and why is it a problem? It's water, right? I mean, it falls from the sky, it's, you know, it sustains us, everyone needs water. But the problem is um, that it can either be too much, so it's a quantity issue, or it can be a quality issue because every drop of water that hits a, a, a hard surface picks up pollutants on its way to the nearest water body. So those, um, so regardless of the path that it takes, those pollutants are just waiting on those hard surfaces to hitch a ride and be set free in the nearest water, nearest surface water. Whether it's Puget Sound, whether it's a, a stream or a river, it all ends up there eventually. And who's responsible for creating stormwater pollution? Well, you know, back when we were talking about the Clean Water Act in the beginning of the Clean Water Act, we could point to those sources and say, hey, this is a problem because this business is discharging X pollutants. Well, stormwater is all of us. It's all of our activities that we do on a daily basis. So there's some examples, you know, you wash your car um, in your driveway, you don't pick up after your pet, um, your car leaks oil and grease and um, you put pesticides or fertilizer on your lawn and it ends up in the waterways. So it's all of our problems. We can't, um, we can't point at somebody else and say, you're the problem. It's all of us. All right, so what's in stormwater runoff? All right, so, you know, it runs the gamut, of course. Like I said, if it's on the ground and gets rain on it, it's gonna wash off. So pesticides and fertilizers, oils and grease, heavy metals like copper and zinc. So copper from brake pads, which are being um, phased out in Washington state, uh, but not quite. And then um, zinc, which is a ubiquitous chemical or ubiquitous metal that's in any galvanized surface. So like chain link fence and um, HVAC systems, anything galvanized is gonna leach that zinc into the, um, into the stormwater. Soil particulate, that's a problem. Um, you know, dirty water getting into the the streams can cause problems for salmon. Um, bacteria, again, from leaking septics or from your pets. <clears throat> Soap and surfactants, again, washing your cars or washing your fleet vehicles or your, you know, whatever it is that you're washing outside. Industrial chemicals, pharmaceuticals. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is that tire dust. And that has proven to be a very, very big problem for salmon in our state. Actually, not just in our state. All right, so where does the stormwater go? We talked a little bit about that. It goes to the nearest water body. It, um, it is not treated in, in general. And um, the, the picture on the right is all of the outfalls in Puget Sound that we know of. Um, some of them are regulated, many, many of them are not. And this was, um, this was done, uh, you know, a survey was done a number of years ago. This is the, you know, the, there, there are more. We know that there are more, um, but we have not mapped all of them. So as you can see, there are a lot of outfalls into our creeks and rivers and into Puget Sound. Um, all of them have some kind of pollution that, um, that can be a problem. And then the stormwater outfalls into Puget Sound, I, this was supposed to be, oops, um, I apologize. This was supposed to be a, a video and it's, um, of course, now I can't go back. There we go. Um, there's a, you guys probably already know about this. There's a woman in Seattle, her name is Laura James. And she was diving one day um, in Puget Sound off the coast of Alki, I think, or off the, yeah, off of Alki Point. And she saw what she thought was a big black column in the water. And she thought, gosh, I don't know, you know, I've never seen that before. As it turns out, the black column was pollutants coming from this outfall. Um, and it, you know, it really prompted her to say, goodness sakes, you know, what is going on here? And why is it a black column of dirt and 
road runoff and cigarette butts going right into our marine waters. Um, all right, so again, where does it go? Into our marine waters, into our fresh water, not treated generally. And so we need to prevent the pollution and do source control prior to it going into these storm drains. Uh, um, okay, sorry about that. Let's see, technical difficulties. Here we go, all right. So one of the things that we have noticed is that there seems to be a phenomenon called pre-spawn mortality, or you may have heard it referred to as urban runoff mortality syndrome, ERMS. Um, it was first noticed about 20 years ago. Uh, it's mostly in very urbanized areas. Uh, it's even in streams where there lots of funds had been spent on restoration of streams so that the salmon would come back to those streams, right? So riparian plantings, um, large woody debris placement, gravel bed rehabilitation, so the, the stream itself looked perfect. It had all of the elements that should be a great salmon spawning stream, but it wasn't. And so what ended up happening is, oops, I'm so sorry about this. Goodness sakes, Lisa. Um, I apologize because, oops, sorry, no. I apologize. I'm going to stumble around for a minute. I, you can edit this out, I hope. All right. Um, I don't know how to get rid of that now. I'm so sorry. Can anyone help me? I uh, it has the power to edit too. So okay, excellent, good. I don't know where this thing came from, and I don't want to rehearse. Um, uh, yeah, that's weird. No mic access. Uh, um, yeah, I think. Do I go back here? Jesus. Okay. So sorry, guys. All right. Let's try this. Go ahead. You can the click the go to. I don't know why it's not showing all of it. Um, yeah. Have you tried maybe toggling with your uh, keyboard arrows? Sometimes that'll. Yeah. Mm -hmm. PowerPoint adventures. I wonder if you can just take it out of presentation mode and back in. I don't know. Yeah, let's try Classic. that. Thank you. Have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? <laughs> I don't yeah, dare do that. Okay, so here it is. So I'm going to leave it in this for, oops. I'm really sorry, you guys. I really want to show you these videos. It didn't work last time, but I'm, I'm, I practiced today and it should work now. Okay, so urban stormwater runoff was shown to kill coho salmon that came back to these creeks, right? And it was found that they died full of eggs. They died well before they, they had a chance to spawn and nobody could figure out exactly what was going on until they realized that it was right around the times that the stormwater was being washed through the culverts and, and, um, and outfalls into these creeks. So let's see if I can play. Oh, for God's sakes. All right, well, it's not gonna play. Oh, yes, it is, I'm just not patient enough. Maybe. All right, never mind. Apologize again. Um, anyway, they do this uh, this sort of gaping that, like they're gasping for air. They turn and they um, they do this sort of um, rolling motion, and then they die. Um, it's very disturbing. And if you have seen it in the um, in the environment, you should you know definitely tell. Um, you know, give give WSU or someone a call to let us know where it's happening, continuing to happen. Um, there is a there is a uh, citizen science website that I can provide to you. In fact, I'm going to write that down right now to remind myself to send it to you. It's um, Feist et al. was the um, the journal, and then they did this great story map of um, of how to look for urban stormwater. Um, uh, mortality and how to report that and, and put it on their maps, which is a great, um, a great uh, service. So, all right, let's see if I can go back to, all right. So, so they realized that it was urban stormwater runoff that was causing these issues. And primarily they realized that it was roadway runoff. So the roadway runoff that they chose to study 
was conveniently located coming from an outfall um, on the 520 bridge into the, the NOAA parking lot up on in Montlake. And um, they realized that, and I'm trying to go back, yeah. So they realized that even at a diluted amount, it was killing up to 60% of the exposed coho. So, you know, they diluted it down, diluted it down, and then, you know, even 5% um, roadway runoff in a, in a mixture was enough to kill the coho salmon. Oh, now it's working, all right. So, you know, what about other salmon? Oh, here it is, geez, okay. So what about other salmon? Uh, chum, um, I like to call chum, this joke for me just never gets old. I like to call chum the Chuck Norris of the Oncorhynchus species because they just laugh and swim right through it. They are not affected at all. Um, we did find that there were some, there was some effect to Chinook salmon, um, but primarily it's just coho salmon for whatever reason. And we are studying that right now. One of our grad students, Stephanie Blair, is studying the blood brain um, pathway and trying to figure out what it is about coho salmon that is so sensitive to this, this uh, roadway runoff. So as you can see, these are, it's not a great video, but chum are just, they're, they're not, they're, they don't care. Chum don't care. It's like the honey badger, um, but coho, not so much. All right, so we know that it's roadway runoff at this point. We don't know exactly what it is about roadway runoff that's causing this phenomenon, causing this problem. So researchers at um, Washington State University at the Stormwater Center in Puyallup did a study of trying to break down what is in that roadway runoff. So let's step back a little bit and talk about the chemistry of stormwater. There's thousands of unique chemicals present in urban road runoff, and relatively few of those have actually been identified. You know, the, um, the usual suspects of nutrients and metals and pesticides and those kinds of things are sort of a drop in the bucket, no pun intended, in terms of the kinds of chemicals and the array of chemicals that are actually in this water. And so one of the things that has been um, sort of, you know, mysterious is how do these chemicals get, you know, where, where are they from? Like, are they all from, chem you know, from cars? We're also finding things like pharmaceuticals and, you know, illicit drugs, like illegal drugs in stormwater. We're not sure where those things are coming from. So that's another mystery that we're, we're trying to solve. But here it is, you know, tip of the iceberg, all of these thousands of chemicals are in the water. How they get there, what they are, it is something that we're trying to, to figure out. All right, so again, that urban roadway runoff was sufficient to kill the coho salmon, not just the adults, but also the alevin, the um, embryo kind of stage, and then the juveniles as well. And they all died within 24 hours of exposure. And that's pretty disturbing. All right, so what in road, one, road runoff is lethal to coho? So we went through this process of, you know, looking at all of the leaks and things that come from cars, right? So we looked at fuels, we looked at engine oils, brake fluids, engine coolants, transmission fluids, washer fluids, brake dust, and tried to figure out what it was. So there was some toxicity from some of these materials, from some of these, these um, chemicals. But none of them were as deadly as when we isolated tire dust and exposed salmon to just tire dust in water. And anecdotally, Jen McIntyre is the one of the lead scientists on this. Jennifer McIntyre is an amazing human being. She's brilliant and has been studying this for a long time. If you ever get to see if you ever have an opportunity to see one of her presentations, you should definitely do it. She's a scientist, but she doesn't talk in science, sciencey language. She makes sure that her audience understands exactly what she's saying. And that is rare in that world. <laughs> so tire dust. So anecdotally, she took a tire, just a chunk of, um, I think it was a used tire, but I'm not positive. She put it in water with 
um, some salmon, some coho, they all died within hours just from it being exposed to a tire. And if you think about that, that is a problem because how many times have you guys seen tires on the beach or tires in creeks, tires in streams? That is not good for the environment for more than one reason. So they broke it down and said, you know, the tire leachate is toxic to coho. All right, so what does that mean though? So they die because of this tire leachate, but, but why? What is it about tire dust, tire leachate that is, that is so toxic? So we teamed up with the University of Washington and some amazing folks over there, Ed Kaloje and, um, and uh, Zhen Yu Tian, and they started looking at tire leachate and breaking it down um, into different fractions and seeing what, um, what the you know, toxic fractions were. So I like to think of this as um, the game of guess who. I don't know if you guys remember that game, but you, you play it with one other person and you have these tiles and the other person, you, know, you, you pick one tile and it's people basically. So um, you say, uh, does your person, you're trying to guess the person. Um, that, that, that your opponent has. So does your person have a mustache? Yes or no. Does your person have red hair? Yes or no. So that's kind of the same thing that they went through. I know that's a, uh, that's a pretty simple, simplified explanation, but, um, but that's what they did here. So they took the tire leachate and they removed the volatiles and they tested it again. Is it still toxic? Yes. So they did it again. Is it some other fraction of the tire leachate. Is it still toxic? Yes. So they were able to narrow it down using a high resolution, high resolution mass spectrometry, which you can see there in the picture. Uh, fantastically expensive piece of equipment that the University of Washington has that they were um, that they were graciously using to to figure this out. So they finally narrowed it down to the point where, and this is Zhen Yu, he's a really, really brilliant scientist. He's a postdoc at UW and the lead author of the paper about this, um, this phenomenon. So they narrowed it down and I'm not a chemist, so I'm not gonna be able to tell you exactly what this means, but they identified the chemical closest to the chemical that was killing coho as C18, H22, N2, O2. And this was a true unknown. It wasn't found in any literature or databases. Um, it, there was some close things uh, associated with crumb rubber that the EPA report, that an EPA report had, um, that had shown. And they were able to say 6PPD itself is not a problem. So they ex actually exposed um, sorry, excuse me, let, let me step back. So they, they found this 6-PPD, which was close to this unknown chemical. I hope that makes sense. And they tested 6-PPD to see if that was the, if that was the chemical that was causing the, the mortality. And as it turned out, it wasn't. Um, they bought some industrial grade 6-PPD and they, um, they exposed coho salmon to it and it didn't really do anything. However, when they realized that 6-PPD is actually in tires as an anti um, to prevent the tires from breaking down. So when you're driving along, your tires are being exposed to ozone and that in, um, in effect would cause the breakdown of the tires, but they put this anti ozonate in it to prevent that from happening. So let's talk about that just for a second. So the tire industry wants your tire to be safe. They want it not to break down. You don't wanna to have to buy tires every year because um, they are fantastically expensive. I know I just put new tires on my SUV. Um, and they, so they wanted to protect them from ozone, from, from the breakdown of the rubber in the tire. So they, so they put it, this anti-ozone in it but unbeknownst to anyone, it was then transforming the 6-PPD into something called 6-PPD quinone. And that was confirmed as the toxicant in the tires that were killing coho. All right. 
So it's a transformation product. And the way I like to explain it, this is not mine. I stole this from someone that I work with, um, Heidi Siegelbaum. Um, and I like to compare it to um, Gizmo. I think you guys are probably all familiar with this movie. Um, Gizmo was a great, you know, great creature. He was happy and smart and funny and whatever else. Um, but he got wet and that transformed him into a monster. So the, six, the same thing is happening with 6PPD. It's becoming something that is toxic in the environment. All right. So we knew this piece of the puzzle even before we knew what was causing the mortality, the toxicity. We knew that bioretention treatment of the stormwater runoff from the 520 bridge in this case was preventing toxicity to the extent that they put salmon in unfiltered stormwater. Uh, they all died within 24 hours. They filtered that water through a bioretention soil mix like a rain garden or a, um, you know, a compost amended um, filter strip. In this case, it was a mixture of 40% sand, 40% compost, 60% sand, and all the fish were alive just from that simple filtration of the water through that media. And that is really good news for a number of reasons. We know that we can prevent the acute mortality in salmon with a very simple, very natural solution. All right, so the solution, green stormwater infrastructure. I think you guys probably know um, about this. It is like rain gardens and permeable pavements. Um, it's bioretention cells and, and other techniques. Um, you've probably seen green roofs and those kinds of things. Just making sure that you're, you're filtering the water just like nature does, right? And so the solutions are continuing. Um, as a source control, the Tire Manufacturers Association has really stepped up and they have worked with us hand in hand in the Department of Ecology to figure out, you know, can they substitute this product so that it doesn't cause mortality? So it doesn't, so it takes the toxicity out. The problem with that is they're very cautious because they want to make sure that tires are safe and they want to make sure that they don't replace it with something that could be worse. And that's, you know, all of our worst nightmares is, you know, it's bad now, but if you don't do these testing um, actions, then it could be worse in the long run. But again, there's a lot of people working on this problem, EPA, um, again, the U.S. Tire Manufacturers, Ecology, Stormwater Center, University of Washington, and WSU are all working to figure out how to prevent this from happening. All right. So uh, do I have time to talk about some of our other projects that are related to this? I don't want to take up too much time. I don't even know what time it is. I apologize. <laughs> I'd say go for it. Okay, all right. So one of the things that we've done, and this is a Boeing project um, that we started a number of years ago. So Boeing, and I gave this presentation in Las Vegas a couple of years ago, that's why it still has the, the um, thing on the bottom. Um, Boeing has a lot of scrap carbon fiber and they were not wanting to just put it in a landfill. They have a lot. And the, way, the reason they have that is because their planes their, you know, their new planes are made with carbon fiber. So they, they, it's sort of like a pattern if you're making a dress. You put the fabric over, well, they put the carbon fiber over the plane, the, the wing, for example, and they cut around it. And then they have this extra. They also, if there's a nick or a, a scar, if something has happened to that wing, they scrap the whole thing. So there's thousands and thousands of pounds of this carbon fiber material um, impregnated with the resin down in um, South Carolina. So when I was, we were talking to Boeing a few years ago and one of their environmental managers said, is there anything we can do to recycle this material? We don't want it to go to a landfill. We can't use it. I don't know, we don't know what to do with it. So we sat down and we came up with the idea of using the carbon fiber to strengthen permeable pavements. 
So permeable pavements aren't used in, um, in high impact areas like freeways or um, uh, airports or um, uh, port terminals or anything like that because they can't withstand a high load. They break down pretty easily. So currently permeable pavements are used more in sidewalks, um, some areas where there's not gonna get a lot of traffic uh, and things like that. So we did some sleuthing and found out that carbon fiber enhanced pavement was actually a very good thing. So um, we made cores and we tested them for tensile and compressive strength that happened over in our labs in Pullman. Um, we sent, uh, well, our toxicology lab tested those for, um, for, tox for toxicity. And we installed it in a real world, world setting, which is actually in Tacoma, it's called the Idea School. And we're monitoring that. They installed permeable pavement and they have monitoring equipment. They take samples to see um, what the pollutant removal is. So it increased the tensile strength and compressive strength and improved infiltration. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the addition of carbon fiber um, reduced toxicity to, um, we use uh, Daphnia. And so uh, the Daphnia, you can see the little picture of the little, uh, it's a little water bug. Um, it actually helped prevent toxicity when we exposed those Daphnia to the carbon, the water that had been run through permeable um, asphalt. And the carbon fiber enhanced the permeable pavement for future stormwater management. So we are hoping that, um, that this proves to be something that is successful and able to be used in more applications. All right, so here's that idea school. Um, I have not been to this facility, but um, I believe it, you can visit it. It's just out in their parking lot. Um, so there's the permeable asphalt and they're spraying water on it as a demonstration to show that it is indeed permeable. Um, and the, the different cells have different amounts of carbon fiber and they're testing it to see which is the most effective. <coughs> Another project that we're working on is fungi um, and bioretention. How, how, do, how do plants and, um, and fungi mushrooms in this case, um, how did they affect the toxicity of, of stormwater? Did it remove more? Did, was it the same? Um, and that, is being written up right now. It has not been published, but it should be published fairly soon. Um, and you can see that there were a number of people, both from NOAA, um, Fish and Wildlife, and um, the Stormwater Center that worked on this project. Um, oh, there was a net export of, I forgot this was on here, I apologize. There was a net export of nutrients, which often happens in uh, bioretention depending on the um, on where the where the compost is um, uh, sourced um, they, it had less phosphorus export with the fungi so that that reduced the export of phosphorus and the plants really didn't show any benefit which has been shown in the past that plants look good you know they're in rain gardens and it's beautiful but in terms of removal of um, pollutants, it doesn't really, it doesn't seem to really matter. All right. And there was an inconsistency of the removal of toxicity. So it sometimes removed some, it often didn't. And it just depended on um, the load and the, um, the nature of the stormwater itself. All right. So we're also looking at the depths of bioretention. Um, and how it, um, how it performs um, and the longevity of the, tr the treatment. So we have a grad student right now, Lane, um, working on this. She is putting 10 years of water, 10 years of storms um, to accelerate the aging of these bioretention facility or these bioretention columns. So she's, it's a two year study. It'll be done at the end of this year. And they're assessing the chemical and biological performance at the end of every water year. So is there a time when these bioretention um, cells actually 
are no longer effective. And that's what she's studying right now. All right, uh, let's see. All right, the other, another one we're doing is um, PAH and bacteria treatment on bioretention. So this is Chelsea, um, one of our PhD students. Um, she is sort of doing the same kinds of study with fungi and plants, but um, she's looking not at so much pollutants in general, but at PAHs and bacteria. And that is a two-year study as well. Um, and it is, I think that one is at the end of this year as well. All right. All right, this is, I think the last one, I'm sorry I'm talking so long, but this is one of my favorite projects that we're working on. Urban trees and stormwater management. How much stormwater do mature native trees mitigate? And the, the project involves two sites down here in Olympia, and they have these probes that go into the tree and they're studying a different a number of different kinds of trees to see what the removal of stormwater amounts, so that quantity issue, um, and how is it benefit? How did the trees benefit? One of the reasons this is so exciting is because I know that oftentimes when you do a development, the developer comes in and wipes out all the vegetation, including mature trees. And we think that that is a bad idea because the trees provide a lot of evapotranspiration um, to prevent the quantity of water from hitting the ground, washing off and, you know, washing off the nutrients, washing out um, all those soils and perhaps blowing out creeks that are nearby. So too much water, too fast um, can really cause problems of erosion in those creeks. Um, so this is one of my favorite favorite uh, things that we're doing right now. I think it's very exciting. It's very novel. I don't think it, a lot of people are doing this. Um, sorry, I went ahead. Um, but that is, a, that is an amazing project. Again, two-year project. I think it's done um, this summer. So I included this reference page in here so you guys can take a look at all of the, um, if you want to look at the publications on this, um, you can go ahead and, and do that. If you have trouble finding them and you want you want a certain one, let me know. I can get it for you um, because some of these are not open source. And that's another problem that, um, that I feel like um, scientists, it costs a lot of money to actually have our papers be open source. And what happens is that they go into a journal. No one can access them unless you're a, an educational institution or another scientist. And you know that it just it's not it's not transparent and i think more people need to know what's happening and be able to read these journals so as often as we can we like to do open source so you can access them all right i think with that i am i am completed <laughs> um the stormwater center uh, dot org is our um, url for our website and hello uh oh what the heck man Am I still on? Uh, I hit some button. I apologize. All right. So anyway, um, with that, I'll take questions. <laughs> oh, round of applause. Sorry about that. That was terrible. I apologize. It <laughs> was great. I feel like I learned a lot and all about that. The green infrastructure to save the salmon. That was uh, yeah. Great. It's not to do there. Yeah. Uh, a South yeah, Sound Surf Rider field trip to this idea school to see the yes, um, the what is it, um, carbon fiber enhanced permeable pavement. I'm all that's yeah. a rad collaboration, so. right? Yes, I think so too. Um, yeah, if you want a tour of that, um, let me know and I can I can set it up. Um, Ani Jayakaran is the um, is the lead scientist on that project. Very cool. That's right. So yeah, any other? I have a couple questions, but I'll. I have a question, Marty. Okay. Um, I'm curious, this is really mundane, but when the street sleeper comes through town oh, and yeah. people don't move their cars, uh, yeah. that they forget or, um, no, you know, whatever. But is that doing good? I mean, I like it because I clean the storm drain at the end of my street. So 
So yes. I like it. it, picks up all the leaves and stuff that I normally would right. have to clean. But how, yeah. does that affect, how does that affect things? Yeah, so um, as far as we can tell, I mean, street sweeping is great. There, in fact, there was just a, a webinar on street sweeping um, that they studied and I can't remember, it was EPA and I can't remember where they did the study, but street sweeping is great. They actually, you know, show that it takes particulate up. A lot of the um, particulate metals are stick to the, you know, stick to the dirt and stuff. So if you suck it up, that's great. Um, but uh, unless you use a very high um, vacuum sweeper that is very strong, I don't know what the word is, but um, it doesn't seem to help the with the six PPD issue, unfortunately. But that being said, they're still studying it, and so you know they may find that um, that that is um, actually being mitigated from street sweeping a little more than they think it is right now. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Lisa, can you hear me? This is Joe. I I can. Hi. Hey, hello. Sorry I couldn't get on earlier. I don't usually keep a mic and a camera on this thing, so I plugged mic in. Hopefully it's working. So anyway, I was uh, curious about your presentation. I think you may have somewhat answered this, but um, my suspicion, based on what you're saying, it sounds like we'd be better off not having drains alongside of roads or that if they're unfiltered and it ran, the water ran right into like a, a drainage area into the ground and filtered through the ground. That sounds like that might do a better job of actually uh, protecting the sound. Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed that first. So you said that having- Having drains alongside roads seems to me like that's part of the problem because it collects the runoff water and diverts yeah. it down a channel that goes un unfiltered right now into the sound. Yes, yeah. So um, yeah, it uh, in general does not get treated. So it no. seems to me that we should get rid of drain. The, the, the runoff's got to go through a filtration system, or maybe there should be more opportunities where it runs out of the drains and into the natural soil to be filtered on route to wherever it goes. I walk Sunnyside Beach every day and I see underwater coming right out of the ground down there. So I know it's filtered from up the hill someplace. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so bioretention has shown, you know, no doubt in our minds that unfiltered water, it killed all the fish within 24 hours. We filtered it through that bioretention, none of them died. I mean, that, that is clearly, you know, a black and white. However, you saw on that map, all of the stormwater outfalls into Puget Sound and the um, rivers and creeks that feed Puget Sound. There's a lot <laughs> and it is, it would be, pro it's prohibitively expensive to provide all of those outfalls with um, some kind of bioretention. We just, one of the things we need to do, we've been doing kind of the same curb and gutter, get rid of the water, get it off the land, prevent flooding for a really long time. I was in Pompeii um, a number of years ago and I looked at the streets there, curb and gutter. I mean, it's just, it, we've been doing it for you know more than 2000 years. We have to switch our mindset. We have to say, um, you know, we shouldn't be just trying to get rid of that water um, because it does pick up pollutants. And we should be, you know, either trying to reuse that water in some way and filter it. Um, it but it's, it's hard for us to make that kind of change to our infrastructure because we're, we are so um, ingrained, it, it's ingrained in us to have that curb and gutter and those drain system that we have now. So, you know, hopefully this will be kind of an impetus for us to really rethink the way we treat stormwater, um, the way we manage stormwater, I guess is what I want to say, and treat it. Um, because what we're doing right now is not, it's not working. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Joe? I'm going to say that's a yes. All right, anybody else? Looks like there might be, is there some um, questions in the chat? Um, maybe not, nope. Resources in there. Uh, okay, yeah. I was wondering, I know as a scuba diver, <laughs> we see tires in the sound a lot and some of them are anchoring buoys that we swim down to to find the dive site. And 
Um, oh. So you see tires underwater a lot. And I'm curious if a tire underwater is as lethal as a tire exposed to ozone. Because um, if it's underwater, maybe it's not as well, lethal, but I'm, I guess I'm curious. Yeah. If you know, so how it's a, toxic is an a, underwater tire? Yeah. So if it's a so there's a couple of thoughts I have. One, if it's a brand new tire and hasn't been exposed to any ozone, perhaps it's okay. But generally, what they use for those is used tires, right? And they build reefs out of them, and you know, you see, um, you know, piles of tires being used for um, for structures underwater. Um, those probably are leaching into the environment, but I don't know to what extent. That's one of the things that um, Jen and I were talking about, like how long is how long does it continue to leach um, 6PPD after the tire is, is used and, and thrown away? We just don't know the answer to that. The other thing we don't know is what the effect on marine water is. We don't know if it affects um, any marine life the way it does freshwater. So that's another thing that that may, they may be looking at. I know you guys deal with mostly with with uh, with marine water, and so that's you know something that we need to we need to study more. That was going to be my question. Is I know like salmon undergo some physiological changes as they transition from the ocean to an aquatic environment, and so I just do we like are all the studies just specifically looking at those fish that have already transitioned because they're spawning, so they're full freshwater fish at this point. Do we know yes. if, if the same is true of fish before they transition? I do not know. I don't think we do because we've only looked at, you know, this started with that urban, I, I can't even remember the, 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 the ERMS, um, urban runoff mortality syndrome. Um, we started looking at that and that was strictly in freshwater in those freshwater streams when the salmon come back to spawn. It just, it, so we have a lot, we have a lot to study. We have a lot of, a lot of things to look at. It just, it hurts my soul. Like I'm from Florida and there's like this whole disastrous phenomenon from back in the day when they're like, let's make, let's chain a bunch of tires together and make big reefs. And so there are these big tire reefs that corals don't really like to grow on. And who knows what they're doing to like the corals trying to grow nearby. And of course, all the metal corrode like the metal chains corroded long before the tires wore out and so then they just had thousands of tires washing up on their tourist oh, beach. No. it was just like this like beautiful disaster just I well like uh, related uh the chum salmon to chuck norris i feel like the anemones and things in the puget sound have some chuck norris like qualities because i'm <laughs> often quite surprised at the number of things growing on like the tires and the creosote pilings and it's like life abounds. Yeah. <laughs> i love that so much we should just be like hashtag cncs chuck norris critters yes love it yeah, yeah. Lime scooters were pretty coated with goo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And oh, some man. underwater cleanups is a chapter. And I think we pulled out 14 lime scooters before oh, the pandemic. Um, so terrible. more underwater cleanups in our future. But people are just throwing them into great for the <laughs> sea creatures. That's awful. But if you think about, you know, one of the statistics that I hope I get this right. There's 300 million tires sold in the U.S. every year. So that adds up. So where do all those old tires go? You know, they go into piles and they go in the ocean, they go into creeks and they go into landfills. And, you know, we're producing more and more every year. And it's a little overwhelming to think about how many tires worldwide we're talking about. And the, the 300 million um, statistic is only passenger vehicles. So it's not farm equipment. It's not, um, you know, any kind of other like large truck tires, um, you know, mining equipment, you know, those big, big things that they use for mining, which mining is an issue in all in itself. Um, but, you know, if you think about how many, how many tires just on top of the passenger vehicle tires there are, it's sort of um, it's sort of mind bending to think about all those tires, and you know we're not sure what else is in stormwater, right? I mean, this is probably not the only chemical that is causing problems. Maybe not in Washington, but maybe in another state, maybe in another country. Um, we're just not sure. 
I just, I, you know, I overwhelm myself sometimes when I talk about this. How do you feel about the, the shredded tire, like people trying to make roads and playgrounds out of shredded tire? I know. Yeah. So we talked about chrome rubber. Um, and if it's made of used tires, then it definitely has the 6PPD in it, right? It's not good for people either. And there was a dam in Pierce County. I can't remember which one it was that was made out of some kind of artificial turf tire thing. They're having to tear that whole thing out now because it's it's a problem. So I guess yeah. that makes me appreciate what your the stormwater center does in that like, you know, we have this cool new widget that takes this thing, but like let's actually test it and make sure it's doing what we want. Cause like, oh yeah, tires sound like a great idea for a thing. But like yeah. that's it's turning out to be pretty terrible. So yeah. And you might have already mentioned this, Lisa, but where does the stormwater center get its funding from? Excellent question. Yeah, so I showed that that um, that slide of all of our funders and, and collaborators. We get money from the Department of Ecology. Mm -hmm. We get money from Boeing. Okay. Um, through grants, through grant pro programs, um, we got a proviso from the legislature to work more on the tire issue. So Jen and Ed are moving forward with their next round of of studies on that, and I don't know exactly what it entails. Um, and I don't know how much money we actually got for that. Um, so a lot so, of, you know, a lot of grants, but not like a huge dedicated, like state fund kind of thing. Okay. No, not, not yet. I'm working on that actually. I'm having conversations with our folks in Pullman about that. Um, yeah. because it, it's discouraging to piecemeal our work when I feel like it's really important. Um, so yeah, so we do what we can with the funds that we have. Um, and, you know, we get support from the governor. Um, we got some appropriations a couple of years ago to do that, um, the ERM study and some, some other um, COHO studies research. Um, so, you know, people are slowly getting more acquainted with what we do. Um, and I'm hoping that they'll find us valuable and want to continue to fund us. Well, I know we like federal, we, we have a Ocean Recreation Hill Day. And one of the things that we were prioritizing lobbying for earlier this year with our federal legislators was um, to fully fund this Clean Water State Revolving Fund, which I believe right. would shunt some money towards stormwater management um, in addition to a bunch of other stuff and improving our infrastructure in general. So yeah. hopefully some of that ends up in y'all's agency or in your organization. Yeah. We, you know, I, I don't think we get money from that fund. I think it's mostly, if I'm, I could be wrong, but I think it's mostly for like wastewater treatment plant upgrades and that sort of thing. I think that's um, what most of it is, but I know that there's like some stormwater language in it. Okay, I'll have to check that out because I'm not, I'm not, I've not tapped into that before or tried to, to access that fund. So My thank point. you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. All right, other questions? I know it was fast and, and there's a lot of information. Um, my uh, cell number and my email are on that last slide. So if you want, um, if you have any questions or want more information, please contact me. If there's any of those journals that you want to see, let me know um, and I'll, I'll get a hold of them for you. Um, and Liz, it looks like you put that ArcGIS map on there. Uh, thank you so much for doing that. I love that story map um, and it you know it has a lot of good information about you know how to how to identify a coho salmon um, I don't I honestly don't know if I would in the wild be able to identify be able to identify a chum um, and a sockeye perhaps but I'm not sure if I could tell a chinook from a from a coho so there's a little oh, tutorial yeah. salmon are hard and they also have a video I noticed um, I love story maps of of the erms the syndrome so a salmon kind of okay good yeah thing, so. yeah good all right. Any other questions? I appreciate you guys being interested in what we do. I really do. And thank you so much for letting us <laughs> I see Marty's hands. <laughs> I really appreciate you having me. Um, yeah, we you know, are so delighted that you could join us today. Um, I think we learned a lot and we're happy to share this presentation with the folks who missed out. So I'm going to go ahead right. and stop recording. And, and please edit.